Thanks for staying us on the conversation. Moving on now to Kenya, President William Ruto has issued a stern warning to his cabinet members and state officials stating that they will bear the full consequences if their departments are found guilty of corruption. In a letter signed by Felix Kuske, the head of public service, the president emphasized that his administration will not tolerate the involvement of state officers in corrupt practices within their respective roles. Now, President Ruto also instructed all MDAs to take necessary measures to prevent corruption within the institutions. The development coincides with the President's decision to reshuffle seven principal secretaries following the dismissal of Josephine Mburu, the principal secretary of public health. Mburu was relieved of her duties on Monday due to corruption allegations related to the donor-funded National Malaria Programme. Now, join us uh, live uh, from Nairobi to discuss this. We have Ken Ogembo, a program manager at Siasa Place, and also Alan Odero, a political analyst, joins us live from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. A warm welcome to you, gentlemen, and thanks for joining us on the conversation. Thank you. Now, I'd like to start with you, Alan. Um, in a few months' time, it will be a year since President uh, William Bruto. Uh, assumed office as the uh, Commander-in-Chief and President of the Republic of Kenya. How has he addressed the issue of corruption in the past year since assumption of office? What's your assessment? Well, thank you very much for having me. So <clears throat> I would point out that um, the Kenya Kwanza presidential campaigns were not in any way anchored on an anti-corruption platform. It was more of a economic issues basically the bottom up economic model so corruption really wasn't really was a non issue during the campaigns it really didn't feature in their pre electoral pledges so so far until the incident which we the incident that came up uh, within the over the course of the last two weeks the corruption the emerging corruption scandal within the ministry of public health which led to the president suspending the dismissing the permanent secretary and reorganizing the Kenya medical supplies agency uh, it all it all been quiet but uh, I would say that uh, I would give credit to the president in how he has responded. We've previously had situations whereby civil servants who have been who have been uh, implicated in corruption allegations, like stay put until their pressure pr pressure from the civil society and maybe the uh, the political opposition forces them to res to resign, or maybe the president suspend them. But so far. We saw the president took an extraordinary step and uh, and dismissed the permanent secretary who was uh, who was involved in the whose line ministry was involved in the malaria program and the scandal that emerged, and then the organization of the Kenya Medical Supplies Agency. But uh, we are an overly political country. People have interpreted it uh, quite differently because that means that there are two permanent secretaries. There is there's one who was who wasn't really who was spared in the administrative measures that were taken by the president. So people have felt that uh, it was a case of sacrificial lamb and everything, but uh, on a comparative basis, weighing against what we saw in the previous regime, I would say that this was quite a proactive measure and not reactionary as it were compared to what we've seen before. That would be my take. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Alan. Proactive measures from uh, President William Ruto. And now, Ken, uh, Alan talked about the economy, and we all know that, you know, to boost the economy, you also have to deal with corruption. If not, uh, it's more like putting water in a leaking bag. Now, what measures has President Ruto directed the ministries, departments and agencies to take in order to prevent sorting occurrence uh, going on in uh, talking about corruption in these ministries? So, uh Thank you. I, I think there are a number of things that we need probably to put into context because uh, I have uh, probably I would support my co-panelists but also deviate a little bit. There are a number of things that we need to put into context. And number one of the key issues is the fact that we have robust laws within the country that is able to take care of all corruption measures and if you look at it plainly, we have institutions including anti-corruption commission, we have uh, the, the judiciary, we have the uh, different DCI, all these institutions are able to take care of corruption measures. However, uh, in the last regime towards the end, it, it was established that almost a quarter of the budget is lost into corruption. And the president then, former president, 
also went into admitting that at least a quarter the Kenyans were losing at least two billion every day. So when the Auditor General says the corruption was being lost, it was a lot a, a quarter of the entire budget was lost into corruption, followed by the president himself admitting, I we understand that the current president was part of the other government, then it clearly shows that our problem was lack of goodwill because we have institutions and we have the laws. But now, moving forward, just to be able to put a, a clear understanding, there is a lot of misunderstanding or the president is sending mixed signals. From the time they assume office, there are a number of things that has happened and that is what will help us probably understand whether he means what he's doing or not. Uh, one of the key things are the people who had criminal cases, corruption cases, were their cases were dropped. And subsequently, they were also nominated to be, uh, to be the cabinet secretaries. So in the meeting where he was reading the riot act, amongst them are people whose cases of corruption were dropped for them to get into the office. So what are we trying to say? Is it a change of tune by president realizing that either corruption was way too much and was going to block his uh, some of the promises that he gave, or they, did it mean that uh, he's just trying to wink the public? It's a bit difficult to tell because there is also possibility that a few, the people whom, with whom we were seeing, because most, the, actually the actions that has been taken are people who worked are were more friendly to the last regime. Would it be they were just being removed for other more friendlier people to be allowed to get into the office? My opinion as an individual would be, I would have appreciated to see consistency in the president's action from the word go, where he would say, I would not associate with anybody with any corruption case, and therefore he would have also strengthened the system whereby the anybody who has been associated with corruption would have not made it into his government. And therefore, it's a bit uh, unpredictable, but I think the president is not giving us the right signal. So we can't really be rest assured with what he's, he's, he's doing. He's giving mixed signal for me. Uh, definitely, we're seeing mixed signals there from the president. And in one way, you're talking about corruption. And on the other side, it seems like some of the cabinet members have also been accused uh, of this, uh, of uh, going into corruption. Uh, let's talk about the case of Josephine Mburu in relation to the National Malaria Program. And I don't know if, Alan, you can tell us more about this. What exactly, what the corruption allegations leveled against her? And also, uh, this talk about the Kenya Medical Supplies Agency Board. Uh, what exactly? exactly is going on around that institution? Thank you very much. For the Kenya Medical Supplies Agency is a parastatal that is charged with uh, procuring uh, procuring medical uh, products on behalf of the Kenyan people. So the scandal in question, uh, the, a globally funded program that was for the anti-malarial program for the distribution of malaria treated nets that should have been, uh, so basically it was uh, between the donors and the government of Kenya through KEMSA with the public health minister, the line minister. So this is where, this is where Josephine Buru, the permanent secretary, and the account, chief accounting officer in that ministry comes in. So there are allegations that uh, the tendering process was compromised to the extent that uh, uh, highly placed individuals within the government interfered with the open source tendering system to, with a view towards favoring one of the, a company that really didn't meet the qualification, really, didn't really meet the, Literally meet the requisite uh, precondition. So the donors, the donors like uh, raised, a, raised a, an alarm. They caught uh, they caught the scandal in midway evolving and raised an alarm. Raised with the, the president. And the president, after being briefed by the investigative agencies, we learned from the press that uh, he, uh, he called a meeting of the top brass 
and instituted the measures that he took. So Josephine Boru, in terms of being implicated, is since being a permanent secretary, that's the chief accounting officer in every ministry. So as the chief accounting officer for the public health ministry, mm. she was lying, she was right at the center of it. She signed the letters with the correspondence between the government of Kenya involving camps and then the donors. So that's how she's been caught up in this mess. But it's uh, uh, piggybacking, piggybacking to what my co-panelists have said, uh, I would argue that corruption uh, it's a difficult matter in this country because uh, the threshold of sustaining a conviction within a court of law, I would say, is relatively quite high. You know, we've got independent institutions, but there's a fine frustration in the sense that we haven't really seen uh, serious convictions before the court of law. Mm. So people have been quick to blame the judiciary on one hand, but I would think that uh, if the directorate of the public prosecution, because the judiciary decides cases based on merit on an, obje on an objective basis, you know, so if a weak case is if a weak if a case presented before a court of law is weak, then there is no way that we can expect a conviction to be sustained. So I agree that in the previous regime, we saw a number of individuals who are charged with corruption. Then as this regime took office, the cases have been mysteriously dropped. The DPP has been quick to claim that he each he, he presented the cases against these individuals in court in the previous regime under political pressure, that he, the from the outgoing executive. But one would, one would then be quick to, uh, to question that uh, how certain are we that even right now the dropping of these cases are not out of political pressure because as my co-panelists are saying, I agree, a majority of them are people who are quite close to the current executive, uh, the current president and the executive because uh, so the argument is that they had been persecuted by the previous regime. But there is a need for eternal vigilance because... Uh, who knows? Who knows whether in the next government, someone would uh, the next the, the next direct public prosecution will look at the cases and also make the same same argument that they were dropped out of political pressure. So we are in a catch twenty two situation, but uh, we, we adopt an optimistic view based on the fact that we have a robust constitution and then our independent institutions. But they, they, the institutions should be will be as good as the character of the individuals that hold them. So. The current DPP is outgoing, it's been nominated to head the country's intelligence agency. So we hope that the recruitment process for the next director of public prosecution will present the country with someone who is more robust, someone who is politically neutral, and someone who has the spirit of uh, actively sustaining the anti the war against graft. Mm. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Now, back to you, Ken. A former chairman of the Parliamentary Trade Industry and Cooperatives Committee, Kanini Kegap urged President William Ruto to personally supervise the war against trade cartels. How badly have these cartels infiltrated institutions? And Kenya, uh, can you also tell us more about their operations? Hello, Ken. Uh, are you there? Yes, yes, please. Okay, go ahead, please. Can you come up again? I, I missed what your question, please. No, I said the former chairman of the Parliamentary Trade Industry and Cooperatives Committee, Kanini Kega, urged President Ruto to personally supervise the war against trade cartels. How bad are this uh, cartels? How bad have they infiltrated the government? Uh, can you tell us more about their operations? <laughs> yeah. I the, the cartel issue is, uh, it is bad. Because uh, let me get back to the point where we are talking about cancer. In the last regime, all the, there are cases that were identified and there was the president gave timeline within which they were to report a commission was established, nothing happened. So you realize that the level of uh, uh, the cartels, the level at which cartels work is in Kenya is where the tenders, the projects and tenders, the, the corruption happens at the tendering level. Mm. So by the time you realize uh, all the documentation is done, everything is put into place and you realize that it will be so very difficult to do any conviction. So how do you know that 
standards were probably compromised. Look at the current regime. A number of uh, tenders that were already in place are being cancelled, re-tendered, and then are now given out again. Looking at the same thing, you will only see probably some of these tenders goes to the same companies, but at a different price. So that is how deep the cartels are. So there are people who are so connected to the extent that uh, they are able to influence what gets into the budget, and therefore they eat from the budget. Uh, if you want to know it, so please look at the appointments that we are currently having, where the president was able to cancel a number of board appointments and then introduce his own people who are going to work, even though the people whose uh, uh, contracts were terminated from the board were either appointed just one year ago or two years ago before they could finish their term. Mm. So the question is, uh, why is it so difficult that money is lost from government but there is no conviction that can be established or no one is uh, uh, is held liable. So basically to understand how these things work is that cartels are within the political system and they have the protection. That is what is happening with, with the cartels in Kenya. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ken. There's a very serious issues going on in Kenya. I think that's why the talking about President William Ruto personally dealing with this issue, talking about trade cartels, talking about corrupt cabinet members, uh, talking about also building the economy. But thank you so much, uh, Ken, for joining us and also Alan O'Dara for joining us on this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. This is where we'll draw the curtains for today's edition of the conversation on the first half. We dealt with situations in South Africa where there's been mounting pressure on a certain Russian ship and the dealings with South Africa and Russia. And there have been allegations that South Africa has failed to provide documents uh, for this particular ship. We just finished conversations now in Kenya where the president is talking tough. But at the same time, there are questions concerning how acting tough he is uh, concerning the cabinet members who have also been instituted or rather uh, uh, accused of being corrupt. We'll see how that pans out, but this is where we'll draw the curtains for today's edition. To join us again next week for another edition of The Conversation, I am Rita Omodia. And I'm Binga Borough. Thanks for being a part of the programme. Bye-bye.